Starting a new year in Wizard Magazine 1997. Have we hit the bottom? Have, has, have comics bottomed out in the 90s yet, Ed? We're gonna find out. Hello and welcome to your favorite YouTube channel, Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piscor. We are looking at Wizard 66, February 1997. Before we do, I want to remind everybody that we are on the road to 100,000 subscribers and we need your help. Hit that subscribe button underneath this video if you haven't already. And be sure to share the videos that speak to you the most so that we can get more subscribers. I also want to remind everybody we are a daily comic book YouTube channel, over 1,700 videos in our back catalog. You can search those on the Cartoonist Kayfabe YouTube homepage by creator, by title, by character. You will find videos you love there. And finally, we are partially brought to you by the Cartoonist Kayfabe Patreon. There is a link below this video to our Patreon. Three different levels will get you access to our videos early. And at the King Kayfaber level, you'll get access to all of our videos first because you sit in on the recording session. Hello, King Kayfabers that are watching us right now as we record this. The benefits of that is you can beat the kayfabe effect. Whenever we show off a rare book or a hard to find expensive book, you'll be the first one in line picking that up before it disappears from the aftermarket or goes up in price. Uh, this has happened many times in our history. So uh, check out the cartoonist kayfabe Patreon, see which level works best for you. And with that all said, Ed, Wizard Magazine 66, February 97. We just got done with the big five year anniversary issue of Wizard and Things look bleak here in 1997. <laughs> and the first thing I noticed when I pulled this issue this week, it's a thin issue. What this means, and everybody who's paid attention to magazines over the last 20 years have watched these magazines go from giant stuffed full of advertising magazines down into almost nothing. That is what I see whenever I see this issue. And uh, we've talked about that on previous episodes. Made me think, what all has changed in Wizard Magazine in the five years we've been covering it? One of the standouts, there was no manga in those first couple of years worth of Wizard Magazine. So kind of interesting as we go through this to kind of look and think, Wizard continues to evolve in an effort to keep their fan base alive. And uh, it'll be interesting to kind of see how they are almost feeling in the darkness to try to like stop plummeting sales. Well, that's that's true. And, and to be honest, I do not think that the Wizard sales personally for that business were, were really plummeting. I, th I think that they were, you know, on, on the rise. And, and uh, I think some of that is even evidence with our videos. When we put these things out each week, th the next one is m the more popular one. Like it's receiving a critical mass. And, and the way that you could t tell that is also by the ads because um, it's, it's Hollywood movies who are advertising and uh, video games that have like real, real budgets. So, it's almost like the comic guys can't even afford to buy ad space in the in the comic magazine, and we will see within the pages of this particular issue when it's you know Batman versus Captain America who would win in a fight that there this <laughs> there is nothing to do with this being like a proper trade magazine or for people of our stripes who who are interested in you know the making of comics. You got to go to Comics Journal for that. This is now um, just a uh, you know, popcorn, cash wrap at the grocery store magazine. Lowest common denominator. By the way, I think that is the direction we're going to see more of, though, is that pop culture, like, movie kind of stuff. Chase Absolutely. that. Chase the toys. Chase the video games. And to your point of, like, a bigger audience or more popular videos, I think that does bring in a bunch of people, you know, fans who are interested in whatever the upcoming Kevin Smith Superman movie is or right. the Spawn cartoon. Um, we have two different covers here. Wizard had this long practice of having a newsstand edition as well as a direct market or comic shop uh, edition. So same contents inside, but you see the two different covers. Obviously, the newsstand being the big iconic characters, Batman and Captain America. Yeah, the ones that mom and dad would be able to recognize. Exactly. And you had a poly bag version, Ed, so we can show some of the stuff that comes packaged. Pull out poster of X-Man by Roger Cruz. An ad, basically... Uh, soliciting your contact information and there's a couple of these scattered throughout this issue you would recognize them on the um in the 90s marvel comics they would have like mail away mail away uh coupons and stuff like that where you could go get comics off off them and i have seen um people posting comments about 
criticizing American entertainment as one of those speculator theaters, you know, oh, totally. that really contributed to uh, to and and. I was guilty of this because they would have discounts on, like, buy three of Youngblood exactly. number one, and you get this little price break or whatever. Like, they but were pushing volume, too. Buy ten, and you would get, you know, a price break. So, yeah, absolutely. That's, as soon as you said that, that's the first thing that came to mind. That's funny. And then uh, your AOL <laughs> disc, which... Uh, Pop this into your computer. Let's see what happens. <laughs> Yeah, I wonder. This is this is one of those uh, probably age markers that we're going to be seeing pretty soon. Is uh, you're, you're a boomer if you were getting getting your your internet on your disc. Yeah, where kids see this and they're like, "Oh, that's the uh, you know directory icon on your computer," or like, it, you know, isn't this on some icon in the computer or something? That's amazing. I haven't seen one of those in a while. No, always benefit when we have some of the swag. Uh, yeah, included. I like seeing seeing some of that package stuff. But with that said, it is time to dive in here and. This direct market, J. Scott Campbell on the uh, cover, the hot Gen 13 artist at the time. Gen 13, what I've learned, selling about three times your average Image comic at the time. It really was the breakout hit for Wildstorm and, and kind of for Image in general. Uh, I don't know that Campbell sticks around much longer. Word about issue 15 of Gen 13 ongoing series, I think his run is, is really close to the end. I think, uh, was it issue 13 that came out with like ABC where it had Bone and yep. a lot of those characters? We, we did a uh, video on that, a, a really cool little comic kind of couched within in that series where uh, the Gen 13 characters uh, get involved in, you know, the multiverse. And I'm trying to think of some of the other characters. Obviously, there's like the Spawns and the other image Jeff characters. Jeff Smith's Bone. Yeah, that's that's the other big one. And then like... Probably it's Probably Ash. There are a Flaming lot. Carrot or something. Yeah, there could be. There's, there's probably 20 different characters in there. So they did a good job of like, let's round up the creator-owned characters and, and put them... Cerebus must have made an appearance, I'm guessing. I don't know about that, but I think Madman yeah. was in there. Yeah, kind of a kind of a cool gimmick, and uh, check out that video. Definitely look that one up. Okay, you know what, dudes? Just uh, speak to your point of um, Campbell maybe not being on the series that much longer. I think Joe Mad is done with X Men at uh, three fifty. I, I, I think so. You know, you got a half a year probably before Cliffhanger is going to be coming out, uh, and this is you know we're getting into a mature Joe Mad here. Yeah, right. As you could tell by the Gilberg Roger Cruz stuff, like, you know, where he's totally cribbing the Joe Matarera style. Uh, you can see that it's fully formed uh, at, at this point by way of Roger Cruz with the bubble hands and stuff. It's amazing. Joe Mad needs to start his own studio. The, the Mad Studios there bring uh, bring Roger Cruz in. When they created that whole new wing of, of art. We didn't cover issue one. We did a Travis Cher <coughs> Chere video. If you have that, we should do that. Yeah, we, we, we should do that one. I think Adam Hughes does one, Jim Lee does one, and I'm not sure if the third guy is like Matt Broom or somebody. It's it's kind of the, which of these is not like the other <laughs> I almost, Sesame I almost spit, spit my tea. <laughs> um, but probably worth checking out. You know, like we've gotten a good response on Adam Hughes stuff, and he doesn't do that many comics. So I'm pretty sure that he does one in that series as well. Yeah, but uh, Travis is using like washes and markers and zipatones, like all kinds of stuff for his for his comics. Yeah, pretty fun one to look up original art online. You can see it too. Most of it's on the board, so you get to see all those kind of weird washes and everything. I like to see that Garib Shameless got rid of the mullet. <laughs> By the way, he has a different headshot every month. Like that is a uh, money is being spent at the local Olin Mills every month uh, to to get the new uh, Garib Shameless picture plug. Yeah, he's doing his predictions for 97, and, and quite honestly, I don't see anything that stands out there. Big publishers will shed their lines of non-performing books. I feel like that might happen every year. It's, it's probably like common uh, publishing practices. Um, none of the letters stood out to me, this this issue. Anything popped for you? There's more talk of the uh, the tattoo stuff going back and forth. Which tattoo is, gate here. Which has now replaced the uh, you know Iron Man versus uh, <laughs> X-Men or whatever. Uh, somebody in the comments made mention that in New York City, tattooing was illegal until 1997, technically. Yes, yeah, I saw that. That's that's wild. It is wild, and I guess I forget that there was a stigma against tattoos. You know, if, like in my mind, it's kind of over by the 90s, but I guess it wasn't. Yeah, and I'm sure that was like a technical thing, you know, one of those technical laws that like when, whenever we need a little cash infusion at, at, the, at the local borough, we go bust a tattoo shop. I feel like all of my friends got tattoos in the 90s, so in my mind, it's like, yeah, even happening Even to this then. day, like, I'm not going to blow the spot too much, but but there is, there is like, an element in the Pittsburgh tattoo game that, that definitely controls the, the, the 
this stuff, man. A little protection thing going. Jack Kirby's Fourth World. This is John Byrne. About the time I'm still into John Byrne a lot. And uh, he's going to write and draw Jack Kirby's Fourth World. I remember it was a cool thing that Jack Kirby was in the title. Uh, you know, since it's his characters and everything. Covers by Walt Simonson. And I mentioned that because a few years further down the road, we're going to get Walt Simon doing or Orion. Yeah. So, you know, like he gets a crack at these characters as well. I need to look and see if I have this, but this may be an issue that is, uh, is worth taking a look at. See what John Byrne did with his dream, dream cast. I always like... Uh you know, Sailor Moon went away, and that and that really hurt people. And what do you see right there, man? Because there were people who were like, "What are you talking about? You had to wake up early to go to go watch the anime." What's that say right there, man? Had to wake up at five thirty a.m. before school. I'm telling you, they would put anime for for a decade. Uh, it would be on at like five thirty in the morning. You had to wake yeah. up extra early. And and I said it before. I'm like, yo, girl, girls weren't waking up that early, but like dudes were to to fuck with uh, that stuff. And but it just wasn't enough. I had this issue, man. So I, I remember it fondly. Like that, that Martha Washington goes to war thing. Fondly isn't the word, actually, but you know what I'm saying. How about dynamic forces? They're still in the game doing the same kind of kind of grift that they were doing even back then. That's not dynamite, right? That's a separate. That's not. I do think it's a different business. Yeah. Um. But uh, yeah, both of them are. Well, I guess dynamite. The publisher isn't here, but yeah, dynamic forces still does the same bullshit. Um, I thought the letter art was interesting to note. A couple of manga anime envelopes. Yeah, shout so. to Kira Toriyama, man. That that fucking hurts. stings real bad to me, Jimmy. It really, really does. It hurts. So, I couldn't... I read this, and I had to check the cover date and be like, is this an April Fool's issue? It's really bizarre. Like, they talk about taking time off, and they're going to have somebody else, Grant Morrison and, and Mark Miller, do 12 issues. And then they're going to come back because they have like stories leading up to issue 150. It was just really strange reading this. Yeah, but what uh, what is noteworthy is that Mark Miller is still deeply connected with Grant Morrison. It's Senpai Kohai shit. And it's it's been that way for several years. At, at Well, several months at this point, I guess. Where, they co-wrote quite a few books. Yeah, yeah, totally. And... and uh, you know, earlier conversation with Morrison, he brought up Mark Miller. We interviewed Mark Miller and he talked about like whenever he got his foot in the door, he didn't give a fuck what you wanted him to write. He would write the who's who entries for characters, what, what, whatever. Um, so, you know, that's a noteworthy piece. X-Men Wildcats crossover mentioned that we saw the ad in the front. And uh, I didn't realize Scott, that's a Scott Lobdell. So maybe that's his, uh, his, his high mark in the comics business. And, and what uh, pushed Travis uh, Charest out of America and to go to, go to France to learn how, how to make good comics. Yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll probably have to take a look at those. Um, it's so fascinating because here's the Hulk and Pitt crossover being announced. We do have a video on Cartoonist Kayfabe covering the Hulk Pitt crossover. Noteworthy to me because... Del Keown had done such a good Hulk. Like, it's kind of the perfect formula, at least uh, theoretically, for one of these crossovers. It's interesting also because Peter David really kind of has to eat crow a little bit because he was such a proponent against mm -hmm. Image Comics. Like, he was this, this like, clear, like, antagonist to the Image Comics guys. So, has to eat crow a little bit by, you know, working with uh, one of the Image dudes. Of course, the Jeff Smith thing is very noteworthy. He, 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 he found his footing in the midst of the loss of distribution that happened in the, the middle 90s and everything and uh, found, found some, a little foothold by connecting with Image Comics to help write the ship or just give him a clear idea of like where the business of comics was going. And it made me think about our semi-recent shoot interview with uh, Paul Pope when he was talking about losing a big chunk of money because a distributor uh went went away paul pope columbus ohio cat jeff smith columbus ohio cat these guys are connected so paul was commiserating with jeff smith and was like damn dude i lost like x amount of dollars and jeff smith was like oh yeah same distributor i lost double x amount of dollars and paul pope was like oh okay okay <laughs> i get it milestone media rumors are circulating that uh dc comics has is canceling that Interesting to me because we covered this three years ago, maybe four years ago. Like whenever I think of like Wizard being like, this is comics with all this energy and money happening. Milestone was one of those many universes. I haven't like, heard it mentioned in years worth of Wizards. They, they, 
they did not get a shot. <clears throat> like they, whatever kind of uh, goodwill you know DC was trying to put together, uh, you know they they published the comics, but they did not support. I mean, the comics. I, I, I don't all. remember the last mention. It's been a long time since I've. That's why this caught my eye because totally. it's like I didn't realize they were still publishing because I haven't seen them mentioned in Wizard in, in a long time. There was a feature on them, probably in issue thirty nine, uh, and it was you know a substantial article, four or five pages. But that was pro- that's probably it. Boy, Wildcats are busy, busy. JLA Wildcats planned with Grant Morrison, the writer of JLA at this time, Howard Porter, basically the creative team of yeah. JLA taking this on. Um, I don't remember seeing this, but that does not mean it didn't come out. It just uh, wasn't wasn't what I was looking for at the time. Um, it's astonishing to me seeing these crossovers, these big company crossovers with the A-list creators on them. Like every like all the eggs are in the basket of like. Just hot shot. Just keep us, keep our heads above water. That's it. that's how the uh, image dudes knew that they were fucking big willies, man. And that they that they really had an effect beyond just the pure financials. When you're able to make these deals with Marvel and DC and take their A list creations, combine them with the characters that you created last year, that's that's a statement. Yeah. At Biscor here, going to have a solo art show with all the best hip hop family tree uh, artwork at uh, the 707 Gallery in downtown Pittsburgh from April 6th through the end of August. If you're going to be in town, make sure you uh, swing through downtown Pittsburgh, check out that art show. I also have the Switchblade Shorties daily comic strip that I'm presenting to you on all of my social media platforms, and there's a dedicated uh, webtoon where you can get the latest Switchblade Shorties comics. Hip Hop Family Tree Omnibus, 40% off on Amazon right now. X Men Grand Design Trilogy Trade Paperback, Three Flavors of Red Room, Crypto Killers Trade Paperback, Trigger Warnings, and The Anti Social Network. Jimmy has Street Angel, Princess of Poverty, Street Angel, Deadliest Girl Alive. He's self publishing some stuff. True Crime Funnies, Black and White Zine, and the 1986 Zine are available at his website, jimrug.com. The Jim Rug Hulk Grand Design is uh, out of print in its treasury edition format, but it's coming to you soon in trade paperback. Now that we're done paying the bills, let's get back to the video. Walt Simonson has joined the Legend imprint here, going to do a Star Slammers, another miniseries, this time under Dark Horse's Legend imprint. Yeah, it's they're promoting the uh, a new um, Sin City one-shot. Of course, before the very first one was um, the Bay Bore Red uh, and other stories. And now we're going for uh, sex and violence. And I think that there are maybe like three or four total. You know, Silent Night comes before this one. Uh, but but uh, he starts playing with those spot colors in the Babe War Red. And then in this one, he starts to do the uh, like light blue. And it's that character that shows up in like all the rest of the miniseries. I mean, the, the one shots. There is a collection of those. I forget what the title of that collection is. Maybe it's like called like Broads and Bullets or... Yeah, that B- sounds right. Babes, broad bullets, something, something like that. maybe might be in there right, somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Marvel lets 115 employees go. Laid off 115 people. Makes me curious how many people were actually working there. Uh, reported a $12.5 million third quarter loss. It's sixth consecutive quarterly loss. The announcement of layoffs comes one week after financier Ron Perlman, not to be confused <clears throat> with the actor from Hellboy, uh, whose holding company controls about 80% of the company, offered to pay $350 million for new Marvel shares of stock in a bid to keep the company out of bankruptcy. Yeah, so good we're mo- starting to build. Good money after bad. Yes, uh, although, you know, who knows what Perlman's plans are, because that's what's going to be coming up once they get into bankruptcy and a he, couple of parties are fighting over control. He's going to Mitt Romney that shit, man, like, uh, you know, sell, sell the bones. That's there. certainly uh, something some of those Wall Streeters looked at Marvel as being, you know, potential for. It's all it is. Jay Lee returns. Didn't realize he was missing, but he's been gone since uh, the Hellshock miniseries from Image in 1994. Took a couple years off. Has been working on an ongoing series and uh, critically ana- analyzing what he's up to and trying to get better. And it's such, I, like, uh, fucking good luck, man, because he's talking about spending three years researching... What are you talking about? Like, I, th- I think I have, I definitely have the first miniseries, and there was at least one issue of like the second one that came out, right? Did oh yeah, I think I think it, I think there were a bunch of issues of the sec- of the ongoing. Okay, uh, three years of of, of what were you researching, Jay? 
Yeah. Because it's like, the, you know what it is, dude? Like, these guys that get into the game drawn, because, cause, like, I could, I could put myself into that camp. Like, it was penciling that got me interested in, in comics. Um, the story part is in their head so clearly, and it does not show up on the page. That's everything that went wrong with, with Image Comics in the first place, you know? It's like, it's such a clear vision in their mind, but they cannot articulate it using both words and pictures. And uh, he certainly you know, was victim of that with, with hell shock. And, and that's where he blew his load, you know, like, like the death of that brand of Jay Lee. I think people told me, you know, K, people from the kayfabe audience, they would talk to him, you know, at shows and stuff. And they, he said that he like physically can't even draw in that style anymore. It's like impossible. He, he forgot how to draw that way. It makes me sad. I think he's a very good artist, uh, in, in what, I, in, Several eras of his style. But yeah, that course. one that spoke to me was that one where he's doing like nine pages a day. Namor, Youngblood, Strike Files, Wildcats trilogy, just just scra- dumping ink on the pages. It looked like. Yeah. And uh, I really love that stuff. I still look at that stuff and think it's awesome. And uh, kind of bums me out. But a lot of artists go through this. You know, in some ways, we've talked about Silvestri a lot over the last several issues of Wizard. And I feel like he's a guy that did that. Went from doing biweekly issues of X Men to like. I run the company. I'll take all the time I want. I'll make it exactly how I want. And it's like, good for them. But man, I love that energy that would come from like deadlines and maybe a little bit overbooked. I lingered here just to kind of show like what's going on with Wizard Online, you know, the various chats and clubs and things that you could go and take part in. Because I have a feeling like there were fans that really engaged that way, you know, found their peers and people to talk about their comics with. Yeah. Uh, oh, dude, you go to go back real quick one time. Check this out, man. Big Apple Comic Con. We we just did that in um, we just did that in uh, December. And if you take a look at the venue, St. Paul's Church Auditorium. It's a fancy word for church basement. And I've been to those in like you know two thousand two thousand one. Yeah, it's fascinating. Wonder how long that that kept going because I feel like they they changed at some point whenever the venue wasn't ready one day for one of their shows as a uh, as a pivot moment in their history. When we were looking at Legend News a minute ago, I skipped all the Mike Allred stuff because I knew this was going to be called out here. Um, has a huge year planned for, for Mike Allred. So Superman, Madman, three-issue crossover. Again, everybody's getting on board these crossovers. I feel like this is quite an achievement for Allred. I like Allred and Madman, but up to this point, like, you know, it's a Dark Horse book, and he's probably not the A-list guy in the Legends lineup at this time. Relatively a newcomer. And... uh that's a pretty good score, I think, to be able to get three issues prestige format with Superman. Uh, it's not prestige format, isn't it? Aren't they oversized? If if they if they promote it that way, that it didn't turn out that way because because I have I have two of the three and they're just they're just issues. Okay. Yeah, and uh, you know I was fully on board. I was fully in the the all red camp at this moment. So I was scooping that up and Red Rocket Seven. I said it in the shoot interview. Um, it it was a big inspiration for uh, Hip Hop Family Tree. In that he creates this like intergalactic Forrest Gump, we could call him, and he goes through sort of the early history of rock and roll from you know Chuck Berry, Elvis, Bowie, all that, and these are characters in the comic, and I just didn't even know that that was even legal that you could even do that, and the characters were all spot on, great char- not not char- great at capturing likenesses as opposed to caricatures, you know it's not a it's not a Mort Drucker approach or anything like that but uh super 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 influential comic to me i don't think it's sold because it was a size of record albums and uh of course he, to, to this day retailers are, are <laughs> they hate it yeah they, they that's how you can judge like the uh the boomer retailer yeah totally <laughs> <laughs> doesn't fit in the box uh and finally madman schedule update so like he's got his whole year planned out here with uh pretty ambitious you know three issues of the superman crossover red rocket seven i think was seven issues and then a madman the next madman story arc starting in august by being you know not frank miller or you know one of the 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 sort of big willies john burns he really benefited from hitting his marks to us the buying public yes I, i really appreciated that the books would come out when he said they would come out you know every four weeks i was able to have you know a reliable you know, Madman comic for, for for a while there. Then, like more towards the end, it starts to starts to get a little bit weird. I think he also benefited style wise. Just nobody really was drawing in this kind of like brush, you know, poppy, heavy outline style at the time. Right. And it was so refreshing to me to not see the Hunt One Hundred and Two cross hatching of Scott Williams and all his clones. Yeah, it's when uh, that that term like pop pop art like really started to come back into into comics, and it would be associated with him, Klaus, and. 
looking at all their styles, I'm like, okay, so like a thick outline with no crosshatch, that, that means pop art? Like, I didn't understand what, what pop art You know what they meant. mean by, because I it, it's not like pop art, the art movement. Right. I swear it's like the thick outline makes it pop off the background. <laughs> I see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I think that the, 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 that, that term is used a little bit different than you'd hear it in art history class. But, hey, man, it's still a, uh, in my mind, it's this original style, and I feel like you got justly rewarded for that yeah and you know time. you know what else is cool is he doesn't have to he didn't use the fucking uh mullet head right uh superman you know so they're show, showing a jurgens or you know brett breeding or somebody right there man but he didn't have to do that when guys like the jla wild uh wildcats like it's mullet head and it's um harpoon hand aquaman like all the boring shit i think he might still have that harpoon Oh, is that true? I don't know. It's been a while since I looked at an Aquaman, but he had it for a long time. You need to just put that orange scales and just deal with it. <laughs> uh, Broadway Comics shuts down. This is Jim Shooter's last, I think his last comics, Yeah, big big comics uh, push. Uh, it is sold to Golden Books, which at this point I believe is sort of the legacy of Western, Dell, Gold Key, all of those. Um, they still own those imprints. Uh, they still license the rights to like Turok and Solar to Acclaim and Valiant. Um, they also have Lone Ranger. Somehow they have the the defunct Defiant comics. So that must have been part of maybe how Jim Shooter put together this Broadway deal or something. Um, Shooter still kept on with Golden Books at this time to kind of go through their stuff and see anything valuable here. I don't remember anything coming out of that. He's he's doing super well. Like he's he's fine financially. And I wonder like whenever these companies go away, if there's some kind of like parachute. That, that he get some golden parachute in these, you know, tchotchke companies. Because it's not like, you know, he's hurting for work or... When he does his zooms and stuff, his house looks pretty nice. Maybe smart guy, you know. Not what you make, it's what you save, right? <laughs> um, any company news pop for you? I don't think so. Star Wars seems to be having a lot of luck with their Star Wars license, but we'll see that a little bit more later in this issue. Take your drink, everybody, <laughs> man. We got some more, uh, you know, rich kid California trust fund comic book makers who are trying to get their movie script uh, greenlit by, by way of the comic industry. They're, they're expanding, man. Chrome Warriors, Evolutionaries, Velocity Girl, Knights of Light. I've... Ed, I've spent many, many hours digging through quarter bins, 50 cent boxes, dollar boxes. I don't remember seeing any of these ever. Half page ad in a magazine that has half page ads from, you know, big willy video game companies and stuff. These are those kind of regional comics that I bet you if we went digging around with yeah. in the dollar bins, like we would, we would find the stuff there. Because of course this is California based. Probably right. Uh, where are they now? Catching up with Ron Lim. Interesting to think like he's working steady through from whenever he was hot or whatever, a yeah. couple of years earlier. Like, he didn't quit comics. He didn't quit even the same company. Uh, but for whatever reason, not as high-profile gigs. Maybe it's just the audience is shrinking. You know what? It, I mean, he it's a, it's consummate job, job guy stuff. So he didn't, he didn't run the risk of going to... Because he was considered one of the Elboys. He's one of the Elboys. One of the Todd McFarlane Elboys. Liefeld, Larson, Lee... Lim was yeah. in the, was in the in the conversation at that time, and he just he didn't do it. He would have been coming off of Infinity Gauntlet. That Which was, was ninety one. So like it would have gone from that to an image. You know, if he'd have jumped ship with Image, like man, that would have been a big one to to go from. You know, like that would have been a high profile book to then be like, yeah, go buy my creator own book now. That would have been a good opportunity missed. They list him here as he's supposed to be the regular penciler for DC Sovereign Seven. That is Chris Claremont's book. I think Dwayne Turner is the actual artist on that. I don't think it was Ron Lim. Yeah, I don't think it ever. I think it was always uh, Dwayne, Dwayne Turner. And uh, the the other missed opportunity with his article is I don't see one mention of Chris Silver, X Mutants, or <laughs> ex, is was it Executioners? What was the other comic? Oh man, I don't remember what he did. Exterminators. With that. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I'm not going to fault Wizard for missing out on that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Superman, Mike Carlin, we are not doing this as a gimmick. Oh, or, or, <laughs> your nose just grew, Mike Carlin. Oh, man. We have a video in Cartoonist Kayfabe archives of this issue whenever the new Superman appears with this new uh, costume and the powers that come with it. You can find that in our archives. Um, check that out if you're interested in how this goes. Uh, I don't have too much to say about this. I kind of... It, it's all right for me. You know, you've got a 60-year-old character here. Try something different with him, but I don't know that this went anywhere. It may not have been aimed at me. They 
Roman Reigns that for a while. I actually, it's so silly, but I, I jumped on board at this time after this article. I was always interested in Ron Friends. I followed his career. I um, routinely would grab when those Senate inked um, Thors as they were coming out. I wasn't so interested in the scratchy inkers uh, on um, Thunderstrike whenever whenever that came out. Um, but it was a big deal whenever Friends went to DC and was doing mullet yes. head Superman. It, you know, it was like they really poached uh, uh, a Marvel lifer. You know, somebody who was doing Marvel comics for probably 15 years at that, at that point. And then uh, they were insurmountable comics. Like when you would check them out, so bogged down with baggage that, that like they just were not even fun to read. And then you would have to read. There would be... In the corner box, it would be the number book that it was, mm -hmm. and then it would be this little triangle, and it would be what number that comic is for that year's Superman right. titles. So the comics would bleed into, you know, Action Comics and um, Man of Steel and Adventures of Superman, I think, were the four titles. So there was, like, a Superman comic every week. Uh, that doesn't work, because, like... Now I gotta read some bullshit or read some other stuff. And at a time when, believe it or not, I'm still a, a little bit of a newsstand guy. I don't know that all those books were newsstand books. And maybe like Man of Steel got like the least newsstand distribution. Uh, crazy pose. <laughs> I, th I think they they use this exact pose on the Ron Friends cover. Uh, but the real fun thing is to see the Big Willies give their shot. At a, uh, at a at a costume. I think this is the guy who did the Wolverine uh, yes. co cover from the last thing. And of course, his cover his costume's the suckiest. It's like it's like steel. Th this guy's no good. Like I, I he, they're trying to push him. Maybe trying to create a new Stephen Platt or something. But but he's not the guy to do it. Unanimously, everybody agrees. You gotta get rid of the red draws. The underwears have to go. I don't know that any of these that I'd call them an improvement on the costume. Jerry Ordway does short sleeves, so he's wearing, like, the T-shirt. That's a funny thing to me. <laughs> I don't know, man. He, it's hard to mess with a costume that's been around that long as well. Yeah. And you just accept it. Accept the red draws. Killer Frost. This is a snowman comic. Um, I don't have much to add to this. It's horror. They, they, they pushed it with this, right? So it puts it on my radar. And... At you know the next Pittsburgh Comic Con or whatever, like like I scoop it up. I, I scoop up some of these things. I got Snowman 1944, the the the, uh, the prequel story from you know World War II or whatever. Um, it ain't about much, Jimmy. Yeah, that was my impression. This is one that I've seen in dollar boxes and, and looked at and uh, and not really picked up. Um, comes out of that Hall of Heroes imprint, which I, when I first got hold of like an advanced comics catalog, yeah, that always struck me because one, the dudes looked like McFarland right, style, but right. it was like young guys, yeah, uh, you know, like first comics, and that always like captured my imagination. And I'd pre-order those, but I don't think I ever actually got one from the stores. No. I don't know why, but they just they, didn't show up. Even if I was like, yeah, I want this one, pre-order this one for me, uh, but I never got one. Yeah, no, they were they were never in stores, and and. Uh, it's it's one of those companies nobody ever talks about, but uh, I, I scoop them up whenever I see them in the dollar bin because they're always it's it's a uh, ex extreme energy of young cartoonists right. just getting in the game. I think I think that Trent Canuga dude shows up there um, super early, maybe with Creed. Maybe, maybe it's a Creed miniseries. Yeah, it could be that 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 first debuts there. So that that energy is uh, inspiring to me. You know, right. I, I it's it, it's the spiritual brothers there because i was if i could draw better i would be looking like some hall of heroes dudes uh in you know 1997 right carlos pacheco we mentioned him before and he was doing fantastic four works jumping on board with uh x-men with uh scott scott jobdale interesting they're promoting an artist coming on board because i feel like at some point marvel kind of really pushes away from that like we're not building any anybody else that can then leave yeah all right, this might be the feature article uh, of this slim issue. This is launching Thunderbolts. And it's funny, and I'm going to spoil stuff for everybody, but these are villains, right? It's sort of like whenever I hear Thunderbolts, what I think of is it's a team of supervillains. Yeah. Like that, that became like a clever, I guess, twist. And I think it happens like, see, they're kayfabe in here. They're going full after they bag. Do. yeah. Presenting it as like this great new super, super team, yada, yada. And I think it's the end. I, I have 10 issues that uh that i got into a collection and i 
I've been wanting to read them because I think it's after issue one. Like at the end of issue one, you find out that like Baron Zemo, I think, was like uh, the the leader. And each of these characters is like one of the bullshit villains from like a Captain America comic. You know, like like all that that Mark Grunewald, yeah, Rogues Gallery of like nothing villains. That's, I like that's Bagley like, a lot. Yeah, this is not doing it for me. This illustration—it's bleeding edge Bagley. Uh, he is a job guy, so the new style is no longer you know John Romita style. It's it's still Jim Lee style. So he's he has a pain period before Ultimate Spider-Man, where he's got to like try to kind of figure out that flavor. And uh, and he and he you know it's just it's not natural to him. It's dr- it's driving on the wrong side of the road, and and that's what the aesthetics of these comics are. Yeah, I've never read any of these. Uh, I'd be kind of curious if you want to dig one out, if you think it's worthy of uh, us reading it. I I would be down for trying it. You know, it's funny because the other thing with Bagley and me is I love New Warriors. You know, like that was going in cool to a new team book. So in a a weird way, I'd be curious to revisit that. And the article says, you know, does lightning uh, strike twice? So I'd be curious if, if, uh, if Bagley can have two hit teams. But I do remember the Thunderbolts as standing out as a book that was pushed around this time. It, it, was, uh, it was a terrible time in comics. Kurt Busiek was absolutely the best writer of that kind of comics up against any of those, you know, Mark Wade's, Ron Mars, like any of those. Like Kurt Busiek did the most solid of that kind of comics. So the things that he touched were the most interesting of that time, but also it's kind of by virtue of everybody else eating massive dog shit in terms of their their writing craft. There were no good writers in mainstream comics for uh, for a chunk of time there, with the exception of, like, you know, Grant Morrison continued to fight the good fight. Garth Ennis was in there. I, I think that comics... Marvel DC Comics history could be reevaluated in terms of the writers, and I think you could argue there never were good good writers. Even the writers who I think are good writers, the compromise of like writing to an illustrator going through the process. Yeah. It just really I think it's almost impossible to do well written comics in that system. It's it's the biggest shortcoming of stuff like um the, the 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 requirement to keep the status quo like at the end of the story the character doesn't actually change right and, but I, I I mean there's there's room for that to, to to play but like stuff like Craven's Last Hunt would be a much bigger comic and much more important in the canon of American comics if it just wasn't as overwritten and hyperbolic as as it was you know Dave Mateus is good I think he was the writer on that but uh, now you're now you're putting pathos into the head of Vermin. And we got to hear Vermin's thoughts just because it's a Marvel comic and you got to fill up space and make sure that it takes a half hour for uh, for uh, the kid who's paying 50 cents to read this thing. Um, it's, a, it's a bad uh, contrivance. Yeah, it's tough. All right, uh, Gen 13, I mentioned it at the beginning, one of the uh, kind of surprise hits, probably one of the few popular books at this time period. So we're getting an overview of that. And... I was not reading Gen 13 at the time. I've gone back and scooped up some of those. I read the very initial stuff yeah. and then just drifted away. Yeah. So it's interesting to kind of see what they're presenting here, which is good girl art, but also like crude jokes and kind of a... They talk about pushing the limits and like they sort of limit themselves and there are things that they pull back. This was a panel they took out on their own. Uh, they don't have comics code, so that's not who's dictating this, but they try to think of it as like, I think prime time. one of them says, something you'd see on television prime time. Um, it's interesting, the idea of having a book and then trying to reverse engineer, why is this popular? And I, I swear with, with the... I think J. Scott Campbell is a big reason why it's popular. There's a lot of reasons. And I think, I mean, he's, of course, he's, he's a big uh, part of that. I bet you part of the reason why you um, drifted away was the infrequent schedule of it because you could never count on it. It's the direct opposite of what I said about Allred, where, yeah. you know, he promotes something and, and hit his marks. Uh, it would be so infrequent when these issues would come and you would just cool down. You, like, you would just kind of like get over it. Um, this is a snapshot of a time period because when we flip the page and we talk and, and there's a little piece about all the, you know, crudity and stuff, it's, it's fucking weak and, and corny. But we do have retrospect to look back on this stuff and uh, you can find patterns. Um, one of the things that I think about this compared to the other books of the day is it's simply different. Um, it's not unlike, and it's not about the you know the physical nature of the, of the, the you know the subject matter or whatever. But 
like Howard the Duck comes out was a massive, massive hit. It was just different. It was just like not another fucking, you know, human fly or, you know, one of those, you know, third tier superhero comics. And with what Wildstorm was presenting, inner, you could just put put the Stormwatch title on a Wildcats comic. Go crazy because they might as well be the same thing. They just ha- don't have as good art. Yeah. Uh, so then you present this thing that still kind of has the spirit, but you're actually allowed to have the slightest glimmer of personality in it. The slightest, because this is still, it's not good comics, and uh, it still is a prod- product of its time. It's dated material, but it at least has a little bit of joy put yeah, into it. Yeah, and when I say... Uh J. Scott Campbell, it's not just drawing style, but it is that cartoon. Yeah. Which was just not present in the rest of the Wild Storm stuff, seemed to have no sense of humor. Exactly. And, and this stuff, maybe it's not uh, side splitting funny, but it did seem to have some of that joy of cartooning present. Uh, mention of the Gen 13 bootleg spin off series. This is like your Legends of the Dark Knight Batman, except with Gen 13. And there's probably a few of these that we should look at. You know, Simonson, uh, the Simonsons team up on an issue. Uh, there's some different different artists that fill in here. I always think of that that um, Adam Hughes ordinary heroes issues as kind of unofficially the boot bootleg start. Yeah, probably the start of it. Yeah, for sure. We did we did episode on that. We did episode on the Adam Warren trilogy. I love that one of issues, and I do think that it would um, look good on the channel because you have the t- title bootleg in there. I've I've had the Walt Simonson and the Wheezy one pulled for. Yeah, years for a, us to do. There's one that uh, Kevin Nolan does the finishes on, so it looks like a Kevin Nolan art job. Um, but it speaks to the popularity of Gen 13. And it's it's funny, too, how formulaic it is of like, yeah, that book's selling three times more than the other Wildstorm books. We need a spinoff. Yeah. Uh, Dark Horse's history with Star Wars. This goes through all of the Dark Horse licensed books and I guess the order in which to read them. Or just, like, where they are in the timeline compared to uh, the, the movies. Um, so, yeah. Bunch of miniseries. Like, they, they were they were pumping these things out. And I actually had uh, a friend who, like, that's what they collected. You know, they, they weren't the X guys. They would just get the different uh, Star Wars books. I wish they would put out, like, the artists on, on, you know, like, every panel that we see. I feel like this is a really cool painting. Absolutely. I mean, prob- uh, probably... Don't know a, who did it because prob- it's not labeled. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, uh, and, and I feel like a... that's that's got to be Simonson, right? Do you feel Simonson vibes? Or no, I do that's... feel some Simonson vibes. I don't know if he even did any uh, of the Dark Horse Star Wars, but if so, then yeah, that would make sense to me. I think this bottom one's Cam Kennedy. Yeah, of course, that's Dark Empire or no Heir to the Empire. I yeah, see. he he did like the first run of those, and I think they made a big splash whenever that first started. Like there hadn't been Dark Horse, or there hadn't been Star Wars comics for a while. It's true, and, and I think they hit the ground running. And they they were at um, Walden Books also before there was like a lot of um, yes. co- collections because the 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 pump was primed with the um, ex- extended universe Star Wars novels and stuff like they they had a chunk at Walden Books so that's where they would put these Dark Empires and all of these collections you know Shadows of the Empire was was probably the biggest one of 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 this era it would be Dark Empire because that's the one where Luke goes to the dark side. And is able to is able to push back and become light again, and then um, was that the first one after the mo- position? Like, is the first one after? I yeah, read one yeah, of those books because exactly. I think they might have been based on a couple of books. Yeah, I don't the know the first couple of miniseries. Yeah, I don't know about that one. The, the first book was Splinter of the Mind's Eye, I think, and uh, I, but I don't know that that was the first comic. Yeah. But yeah, Dark Empire happens like what they would do with these miniseries that take place with the characters that we know from the flicks, they would take like one thing that happens. So like whenever the the emperor dies, there's a there's a flash. And that flash is the impetus for um Dark Empire because that is like his spirit leaving his body and then there's the clone emperor. Gotcha. So so like his spirit goes into the clone emperor. Luke goes to the dark side kills the clone emperor or whatever and then comes back to the light and that's never been done as a jedi with the four and it explained like how that is so um amazing that that he was able to do that i remember reading uh because like i actually inherited a bunch of these star wars comics off of uh my friend there's a there's a little um mark on boba fett's helmet like a little fucking bullet bullet right ricochet 
so they there's a whole comic about how that happens. <laughs> that's, that's, that feels like a satire of like the nerd obsession of of continuity. It's George Lucas, and and the cool thing I think that that's what made um that's one of the things that made Star Wars endure in a different way than um Star Trek was that idea of like signing off on the material and like kind of keeping the the extended universe right kind of close to the source material just not letting people kind of go off the rails with it i wish they would have included creative teams on each of these summaries because it'd be interesting to see like who you'd fuck with some of that does, yeah does yeah. cooper does jim woodring that's the thing if i looked and was like oh walt simonson and be like okay keep your eyes out for that one. It, it, it illustrates that this is not this is an entertainment magazine for the fucking casual yeah it's not for people who really like comics i can't believe this feature sticks this has been in so many the, issues and, and it's, it's it'll never stop awful. and the fucking audience loves it they they want us to cover it and it's just like we don't have we don't have the bandwidth to be talking about that shit i think that's a really good spread it's the cover yeah, yeah it's the cover for issue one i think it's pretty strong um most of this interview with peter david uh the the interesting parts for me most of it feature the hulk he's been writing hulk for 10 years so most of this interview is about that they do cover that he's written all these other things like tons of books tv shows movies like super prolific as a writer and not just of comics but of just everything i think that's kind of interesting and something i didn't realize about him that he had done that much it's all work for hire and i think like in recent years i don't want to be getting into people's business too much but he's public about it like i think that there might have been like kickstarters something for for like health you know like yeah. indiegogo shit and it's like you see all this work and it that illustrates that you have to own your shit, man. You can't just do this shit paycheck to paycheck and have no real equity because then at the end of, you know, your run, now you now you can't pay for your fucking your 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 bills. That's fucked up. This is Adam Kubert and I think this is so much closer to a natural Adam Kubert style when he was on those X books. He did a good job. He did probably the best job of anybody Cribbin, uh, the Jim Lee style. Um, but, but it still didn't feel natural. We knew what his natural style was, which was close to Joe. This ain't exactly close to Joe, but I do think that it's, it's, uh, closer to the way he wants to draw. The bad lettering is this L mashing up into the U the way it does. Cause it makes the U look like an H needed that L to just be just below the bottom part of the of the you would solve that. Yep. Uh, that's that kind of tangent conversation we often have. Mm -hmm. um, wanted to pull out this one part because he's very critical of the heroes reborn and they ask him about that. And uh, he talks about how, you know, there there is nothing more aside from the business aspect that was done for business considerations, money considerations. It wasn't done out of any editorial drive. And uh, I must admit to a mild degree of glee upon seeing that Marvel's stock posted such impressive third quarter losses. Stock prices on Marvel stock dropped by around 30%. So... Ha ha. Hey, Marvel, there's your event. Laughter. Oh, and 115 people go get in the unemployment line. So <laughs> that's a rough thing to, to put in print. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, even if you're mad that, you know, it took him three three issues of Hulk to get the Hulk back to where he wanted him to go before this crossover. And he's he's mad about that. There's 115 people's livelihood. You're uh, you're kind of mocking here, Peter. There's there's all kinds of stuff to it, man, because because, you know, he was a get he's. What he's saying there too, man, is he's talking about uh, he's talking about the you know the heroes reborn, like just everything that they're doing, and it is a joke. It is a fucking joke. Plus, also he's cutting promos because now he's uh you know on, on both sides of the fence with his uh, his Supergirl comic, which is what they're promoting here at the end. I did scoop that. I I, I did scoop those books up for a little while. Because um, I, I I really I liked uh, Ke um, Pete. What the fuck is that dude's name? Peter David and uh, Gary, Gary Frank's. Frank. I like Gary Frank's art. Uh, it wasn't certainly not my favorite Hulk, but I liked the way that he drew, and I thought that he was very well suited for um, yeah, makes Super, sense to me. Supergirl. He has a very clean style. Clean, yeah. yeah. Uh, creator combat. This is kind of a extension of Marvel versus DC. This is creators weighing in to uh, say there's no way Wolverine beats Lobo in a fight. Jimmy, please, please carry <laughs> on. Uh, th this was just as a boy. This was so fucking disappointing to me. Look how many pages they gave it too. Exactly. I wonder if it tests well. If it's something that like fans, you know, majority of readers like because there's a bunch in there and 
in my head, this is the direction Wizard goes. Yeah, no, they, yeah, like they absolutely silly, do. I like silly stuff. I, I, you know, I'm on on board for another ten issues. This is probably the year that I'm done. Um, scooping these things up. There'll be Adam Warren will do the basic uh, training. I look forward to that because I think this is the worst basic training. It's pretty bad. Like, Who Jim cares Calipari, about doing... This is just ludicrous to me. Yeah, and, and uh, this ain't... I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Because like, I like Jim Califiore. I do what's, too. What's interesting is like that's hair back there. He looks like this today except without the hair back there. I can't figure out what the hair back there is because that's long, but it's not like waved out. Do you think that's ponytailed? I think so, man. I was looking at that. I'm just like, wow, I, I never noticed that before. But yeah, the aesthetic of this is not, this is not attractive to me. I spent uh, five minutes looking at these two arms being like, did they run the same piece of art? They didn't. There's like a little bit of a drop shadow underneath the shoulder pad on the uh, figure 11, but it's almost identical. Like, what a waste of space. Yeah, it's, this isn't a very good one. Um, and, and I bet you if we talked to him, he'd be like, yeah, you know, they asked me to do yeah, it. Yeah, I'm sure it was something like that. Like that. You know, probably got paid a little bit. Big Guy, Big Book. This is the Jeff Darrow release of the uh, art of the Big Guy and Rusty the Boy robot. We have a video where we look at that, but it's the oversized reproduction of the Jeff Darrow line work. Yeah, we haven't, from, we haven't uh, put Big that, Guy and Rusty. We haven't put that vid out yet, oh, okay. but, but uh, yeah, that'll, look forward that'll to. go out when I'm on the manga quest, I'm thinking. Any video game uh, stuff you need to weigh in on here, Ed? There it is, man. Shadows of the Empire. That was that was a killer app for a minute on the uh, N64 before Gold Deny came out. Still making Super Nintendo stuff, which is interesting. Mars Attacks, one half. Mine is missing. You could still send yours in, I guess. And I think somebody sent us three Mars Attacks, one halves uh, fairly recently. You know what, dude? I was I was scooping these up. Like the, the Power of the Force 90s... Um, Star Wars toys, so so I guess I I lied a little bit and said I was done with with action <laughs> figures, but I definitely was scooping those up. And me and my brother would put them on the wall, and then uh, at one point when I moved out, he went to go sell them, and we had you know seventy of them or something. And I think he got sixty bucks. Jeez, <laughs> you know what? I can see how this is a uh, I guess a, a guy who designs or redesigns figures. Um, I can see how this works as a magazine, like a whole toy magazine that would yeah. be showcasing the new toys. They look cool in photos, but then also kind of the professional behind the scenes part of that too. Like, how do you do this if that's what you want to do? It's it, it was the next speculator market, probably spearheaded, to be honest, by, by McFarlane. He would put out stuff and say that, uh, you know, no gimmicks, no this, no that. But um, the overt kill came with a um, little, uh, what do you call that, man? The little uh, park, parking... parking uh, meter and the, there are three different parking meters and then people are chasing after the one uh so the the speculator boom it goes from uh trading cards to comics to toys uh and to toys and card games for a big chunk of years there and i, I guess it's never gotten out of the uh the card game um speculator market like it, it persists it actually it's it's beyond speculation like it's you know you got um post malone and you got um, Logan Paul and stuff really pumping this shit up and, and, and buying million dollar Pokemon cards or million dollar uh, yeah, so bizarre to me. Uh, magic cards. Well, they they were like the little kids yeah. that were being sold to. Like you and I were grifted in 1990, 91, 92 with sure. our Spider-Man ones. They were grifted. <laughs> Our with, five X forces. With, uh, yeah, with, with Pokemon cards and magic cards when they were little kids. Uh, Palmer's picks. This issue is uh, Joe Chiapetta's Silly Daddy. I think I have like two issues of this, but yeah, it was too. not a series that I would see too much. And when I started getting into the, like the mini comic alternative self-published kind of stuff, it would have been a couple years after this. And I think he had gone hardcore Christian in his comics was what people said. And I don't think I have any of those, but I remember that was kind of the description for Silly Daddy. Which is funny because the the one that I have and the one that I remember uh, seeing on the rack, see, he was mentioned in previous Palmer's picks as maybe like a recommended yeah. choice or something. And it was uh, an issue that has this girl character and she's got like ampersand on her nipple and like a pound sign on the other nipple and like a dollar sign on the puss or, or some, something like that. That was the cover. So I guess that was the pre, pre-Christian pre uh, si- Silly Daddy comics. Well, by the way, I may be wrong in my memory, too, because I don't have any of those Christian issues. I just, for some reason in my head, that's what I remembered, like like he had taken that turn. The other one that I have, though, is uh, it's a flip it's a flip book, 
And on the flip side is a um, John Porcellino yeah. joint. Yeah, that's that's mentioned in here. Um, this is a crazy like column because he basically goes through a divorce, and I guess that's part of what he's writing about is uh, is that divorce. And he does these autobio comics, and then like his next storyline is they're autobio, but sort of in the future, you know, like speculative of what might happen. So, Re- recommended readings, kind of cool. Uh, James Sturm, um, the, yeah. the, the revival, uh, Magic Whistle, Sam, Sam Henderson. Who he had his day in the sun for sure. Yeah, he was he was kind of a popular, again in that like mini comic self published indie comic scene of the uh, late nineties early two thousands. King Cat you mentioned is in there. Strange Growths. Um, I don't know Strange Growths. Jenny uh, Zervekis. Yeah, that's before my time. Although uh, John Porcellino published a collection of those. Gosh, I don't know when. Ten years ago, maybe or so. Skeleton Key. So we got Andy Watson showing up. I love that cover. I think it looks really cool. I don't have that issue, but I like that drawing. Me and, too. Uh, it's very different from the Andy Watson that I that I think of. And it's unfortunate because because like I'll scoop up Skeleton Keys and honestly, on the strength of this image, you know, because it's it's got the it's 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 got a piece of uh, Jaime. Yeah. It's got a piece of Mike Allred. He doesn't draw that way, and it, it becomes. Uh. It becomes so um, cleaned up. Well, I don't know about this issue. Oh, right. But uh, it becomes so cleaned up. And, like, we know what Andy Watson is, man. That, that very precise ink line. But it's actually, it's not, it's just not as attractive as the people who are doing that ink line back in those days. Like, like the like the Chris Wares and, and, and uh, that kind of stuff. Plus, uh, a victim of that shitty font for lettering mm. that was, like, super unattractive. It says look for issue 19. I had no idea that series ran that long. Even lo- even more. Like, I, I've, got, I've got ones in, into the tw- 20s for sure. Uh, Keyhole, which is an anthology between my uh, American Sp- Splendor artistic brethren, Josh Newfeld and uh, Dean Clean Haspiel, um, is being promoted here. I like that cover of that one, too. Yeah, for sure. That's probably new. Well, it's so small, man, but... Is it a Dino? Who knows? Yeah, I can't tell. Who knows? And this last book, Smith Brown Jones, I've never heard of this book. Yeah, and it was on that um, MTV Unfiltered show. That that show is just incredible. Like, I, I need to find a torrent with, with all of it because the way it worked was they send this camera, this camera out. Like, you write in and tell MTV producers about your weird subculture that you're a part of. Right. And then they either send a film crew or like give you a um, camcorder and stuff and then you film a bunch of stuff and then they produce they produce a video about it i never seen the comic one and i i fucking watched this show it's the first time that that um the culture at large heard of furries there's a furry segment which is really fun because the 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 mother is as green to it as you or i w- would be with her kid going to this stuff they show the earliest furry cons and they really are subterranean and stuff yeah and then it ends with Ugh. with the guy you know in hand in hand with like a unicorn <laughs> I, and, and it's a, another dude and um g- going up to their hotel room and it's clearly like these dudes are going to be fucking in their fursuits and that was like the twist ending, you know, that was the M night Shyamalan ending to the shit. And you're just like, Whoa, these dudes like, cause just when you thought that it couldn't get like wackier, it's like, Oh, you guys fuck also like that. That was a crazy thing. But uh, of course the greatest uh, unfiltered episode is the cards as weapons one where the little right. hillbilly boys <laughs> from, from the middle of Pennsylvania got Ricky J's cards as weapons and uh, thought that it was a real martial art and got, way too good at it to the point where That's they can like crack skin and, and uh, you know, <laughs> get it stuck into your body. And during these times, it, it, dude, it's, this is such a formative period of time in my mind. So Amazon exists now uh, at, at, at this time, probably in its earliest form. Cause like on, on, uh, on filtered, when I saw that cards as weapons things, like I thought it was real too. Like, I'm like, Oh, like these dudes got to hold this book. That was a $900 book back then and i it was i was still too chicken to like i didn't i didn't have a atm card yet like i'm still a little too young but um i was still too chicken to buy something online to like put give somebody my credit card information like that that to right. to the wider culture just felt like a a grift like felt like you were being such a mark if you were giving out your um credit card info but it was all all that was around this time Look at these McFarland toys, dude, where he's just making cool shit, like making weird looking stuff and, and calling it, you know, uh, a, 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 a line. 
None of that shit shows up in, in the comics. It's kind of too bad. I'd like to see more McFarlane characters floating around like that in the comics. I'm telling you, dude, grab any issues and if they're still mining the you know first 24 <laughs> issues worth. Uh, you're still seeing fucking Kincaid, Billy Kincaid, and you're still seeing Overt Kill with a busted lens on his eye. Get that lens fixed. So this skinny column... I have nothing much to add to this. They review some different books, give uh, Generation X a five out of six. I believe six is your best. And um, sure, why not? I like, I like, uh, I feel like that book's pretty cool whenever I flip through one. They, they give the X-Files a two and their argument is that they're doing, trying to be too much like, like the show. And uh, I think that's just a good note. I think it's a fantastic note when you're doing some adaptation stuff or playing with some existing material. Use the medium for for what it's worth. Don't uh, just try to do the comic version of, of the show because you're not going to compete with a writer's room. Right. Vince Gilligan was a fucking writer on X-Files, man. You're going to compete with, uh, you know, a posse of dudes that include that guy? And that's a two. Look at him pushing out that chest, dude, and, like, pulling <laughs> that ass out, dude. He is ready. Like, he, he's, he got groomed by Bruce Wayne for years and that's the pose that he shows on the issue one of his comic Hilarious. or no i guess it's issue two and that's scott mcdaniel from uh from, from not too far from here another uh, another big deal uh when when he went over because because he he gained prominence you know he was he was more one of marvel's big guys for that very very small period of time there when he was doing his daredevil and then uh got that opportunity at DC, did did Nightwing went on to become the Batman guy after that? Yeah, that's a good paycheck. So Poison Elves, uh, Drew Hayes, Serious Entertainment now publishing this. I've seen some pics of this. Uh, we have some fans who really like Poison Elves, and I guess there was a Kickstarter, so Vlad was posting pictures of the hardcover. Uh -huh. The layouts, the pages looked amazing. I have a few of these that I've picked up over the years, but I think the series ends up running like, uh, there might be a hundred issues of this scattered across... Uh, couple of volumes yeah um big series drew hayes no longer with us uh but pretty cool to see it kind of spotlighted here and for a series that i haven't read kind of interesting sounding reading the description of it yeah totally and it's always a win when uh in in a in a time when you know marvel dc is just churning out product that some indie indie stuff gets some love though i do think that that is a um an affectation of this article where, it, where it's like, let's do a Marvel, let's do a DC, let's do an uh, image, and then let's do something kind of like out of left field. Yeah. Looks cool, though. Again, one of these books, I feel like we've said it in the past, but I'm, I'm, I'm ready to give a couple issues of that a read. And uh, the usual picks. Again, nothing really popped out to me in this list. Yeah. Batman Long Halloween continues on. Right. Black that's, Lamb, that's Tim Truman doing his thing. Pretty cool. Couple of regulars like Kane is a crime comic I like. It's nice seeing that thing still here. Misspelling. Yeah, Heartland. Heartland. We have a we have a video about that. that, that that's the uh, that's the Garth Ennis, Steve Dillon masterpiece that nobody talks about. Uh, dude, as an illustration of what I was talking about earlier with the with the Spawn stuff. So Spawn fifty eight is is bringing back some of the characters from you know Spawn thirty that uh, that that we last saw. Hmm. All right, Trailer Park. I got to linger here for a minute because of the Spawn movie coverage as well as the Spawn animated coverage. And I realize we've been talking about this a little bit over the last couple of issues. I'm basically out whenever this comes out. Mm -hmm. You know, like I'm not reading Spawn anymore. I probably fell out of Spawn in the 30s, early 30 issues. Yeah. And in my head, like all of this stuff is kind of the same time period, but not at all. You know, this is probably two years after I stopped reading Spawn that these things come out. So possibly some of the reason they don't have as is much of a burn in my memory. Like I saw the movie in the theater, can't tell you anything about it except I remember the fiery hell part being like super CG. It looked like Dreamcast graphics, yeah, man. Yeah, it did. Real shitty. Uh but, you know, a big deal for is this the first image movie to get made? I mean, is it the only one? Yeah, that might be true too. And I don't count that Witchblade made for TV bullshit. Well, it's not a movie. Yeah, I think I can't believe if that's really the only uh, major motion picture, but forty by, million dollar by, budget. Yeah, and by the way, like the the pilot, it, like the Witchblade, it was a movie, and, oh. then it, and then it was his series. 
Was it made for TV? Like, yeah. Was it always? It was a TNT, like, you know, two hour movie with commercials and, and then a, a, a series. But yeah, I guess there, I guess there wasn't a, a thing, man. Well, you know, if, when you don't have the cape, like, you got to have the cape. John Leguizamo is probably the standout. They pushed him a lot. Like, I remember him a lot in promo materials. Poor guy, man. He was in so many duds. Like, he, you know, he played Luigi in the uh, Super Mario movie back in the day, man. Who could have predicted that wouldn't go? So bad. <laughs> uh, supposed to be a live Gen 13, but I don't believe that ever happens. No. And then the Spawn animated movie, we get some, some profile on that. Uh, that, again, pretty big deal in my memory, although I don't remember a lot of specifics about it, except I do remember that they used black a lot more than, like, most of the animation I remember. I absolutely stand by it. Uh, I think it's the best Spawn story that, that you can consume. Three, uh, three chapters, or three seasons. Um, probably, probably two hours of animation per season, I would say, across maybe, like, say, six, six episodes yeah, a piece. Right. Chapel's in there. Tony Twist is in there. Um, they do they do everything they can to like get you some titty in every episode cause, to to let you know that it's a uh, mature. Interesting. I have no memory of that. It was a prime time uh, animated series, so there you know you get to see you know Chapel in a room with a, a bunch of strippers and <laughs> Tony Twist and stuff like this. Man, we talked about it last episode with the uh, Mark Hamill um, thing at the very end. This Black Pearl s stuff. Uh, trying to push it as a movie for so long and uh, i i don't think that ever went but it was one of the like we are now in the era where post speculation boom where if you got a movie that ain't going you got a script that's like stuck out there in hollywood and there's no movement make a comic make a comic and maybe uh maybe you'll get get uh your thing made yeah there's mention of uh, uh, Blade is, is happening. I was going to say, in hindsight, I feel like Blade is really significant. Incredibly significant, because when that thing comes out, uh, before that, love the one you're with, you know, like, love the one you're with, not the, how, how, how's the saying go, man? If you can't be with the one you love, love the one you're with. And that was all of our relationships with superhero movies. Right. Yes, man, I, I rented the fucking Rubber Ears Captain America movie. I, I, I... I, bu I bugged my video store to 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 get that and wondered when that shit was coming out. And I just, like, forced myself to say that I liked it. Uh, the Tim Burton Batmans and stuff, they're not that great. Uh, but I forced myself to, to say that I liked it. I do like the uh, Dolph Lundgren Punisher a lot, but I bet you it doesn't hold up. Uh, so when Blade came out, you take... You know, it's almost like comics, where you take a character that doesn't have so much licensing e equity and uh you you might have some more latitude to do some shit with it to make it a good thing and may maybe that's what blade benefited from because that's what makes it significant when yeah. it came out it was like oh this is this didn't suck a dick completely and then when guillermo del toro comes out it's like oh this is fucking cool that's my spiel Manga scene. Um, I didn't pull too much from this. They're comparing like two different series and two different studios, Viz and I forget the other, Anim Animego, Animego. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, talking about different ways that they're selling these long series. And, and I think, I mean, to me, it is noteworthy because of how ubiquitous anime and manga is. Like Viz really has been working hard for 30 plus years to get manga its foothold here in the States. And so like the, the lady at Viz who was tasked with bringing Ramna over, she's like, Oh fuck, man. I got, I got a series with 155 issues, episodes worth of stuff that I, that I got to sell. Uh, the first thing that you think of it is diminishing returns. So, so she's like, okay, we we're not doing volume one, two, three, four, five. We're going to try to like identify an arc we're going to try to um, get as much of that material onto a single tape as possible and then just call them out by name so that they could be standalone so that you can just just fuck with them um, randomly and still get a good experience. But at this point in time, this juxtaposition is perfect because with all the stuff that I was talking about, like with Akira Toriyama and like pushing away from that when I was like this young and stuff, 
I'm going for this kind of anime. Right. And I am steering clear super far from this kind of stuff. Because, like, this would be pussy to me. But this is, like, hardcore and dope. One thing that I'm curious about is considering Viz's success, like yeah. where they are now, mm -hmm. how much were they cross-promoting between manga and anime? Because I assume that that's... There's a lot of crossover in fandom. Yeah. You know, and it just makes me wonder, and I say that as contrast to, like, you see people criticize the Marvel movies yeah. as not selling the Marvel comic books. And I wonder if Viz... They don't mention that at all, but that was one of the questions I had reading this, is, like, it's interesting that they had this two-headed monster that they're bringing into America... And by all accounts, seemed very successful. Yeah. Were they like, they must have been using them, you know, leveraging, I assume. It's a great point. I, I mean, you know, the, the Ramna books are out there. And uh, even with Ramna, like, they had to figure out how to get these big series into a manageable context for people. So there would be many volumes. And it actually was kludgy. Like, when you go back and you look at them, okay, this is volume four, number 16. Like, you don't know what you have. It's really hard. Because yeah. I buy a lot of that stuff, and it's really weird. I, I Like, I can't imagine trying to keep up with that when it was being published. Well... In, in those single issues. That would be the easy way, because you would just get it on your pull list. Like, like I, I guess have, so, yeah. I have friends that... Um, that that fu that fucked with uh you know Dragon Ball or Pokemon or, like all that kind of stuff and yeah you just get to put in your pull list and it'll just it'll just come but it, it's piecing together the stuff that you got to be very specific in your you know notes app on your phone so that you don't double dip too much. This Votoms is huge or like Rufus Dayglow when we were in Japan he was he was telling me about the importance of Votoms to him which is something that I never really heard of. Yeah, I never heard of it before this issue. This is an amazing contest. They're giving away like all these comics, and if you read a couple of them, like they're pretty good stuff. And I assume this is just stuff they've gotten for reviews. And we're like, hey, clean up the office. <laughs> yeah, I see Roach Mill in there. Yeah, it's it's pretty uh, it's pretty good sounding stuff. Is Gregory three? Is that a more Kempel? Yeah, I think it is. Yeah. Character profile dumb, uh, except for who's this artist? It, it, it's like Nolan finishes right, but I don't think it's Nolan pencils. Yeah, they just don't give a fuck. Yeah, it's frustrating. Cards, cards, cards. For reasons that I can't defend, I ended up looking through a bunch of price guides because something made me think, like, it's really weird we have price guides at this stage. Uh, I don't have anything else to add to, like, top ten comics. You know, I don't know that we've seen much movement from last issue to this issue. DV8 is new. It is. And uh, I did point out last time there was a Liberatory cover on uh, and it was the issue one yep. variant. So that's pretty cool, but... I guess Supergirl 1 uh, being on here also is a, is a new development. Um, Wizard Top top 100, it's still dominated by X-Men. Spawn sneaks in there in the top 5 um, and in the, in the top 10 with uh, number 8 and 9. Spawn Impaler 2 and Curse of Spawn 3. So good on McFarlane. But it does make me wonder. I always think X-Men has their reputation because Claremont made it a top-selling book for 15 years. And that may be partially true. But to your point constant uh pointing out it's that x-men cartoon and i wonder like okay x-men books very popular x-men cartoon now we have like spawn very popular spawn movie spawn tv show and i know those are just starting up but it's still that multimedia push toys yeah. you know like there's still this multimedia push and i mean that's the entire top 10 except fantastic four reboot which is jim lee and you know of x-men fame right <laughs> so i do wonder like how much that other media may be responsible for where these comics are uh, selling yeah very much so i think friend of the show sean chen gets a little uh wizard up and comer deal yeah i thought about pulling out he self-published a book that i got from him at baltimore a couple years ago that was really cool and i can't remember the name of it yeah i just saw it recently uh it, it uses that like imagery from what's that criterion collection movie man a black and white joint uh andre rublev or or uh uh man i forget but oh it's uh seventh seal maybe maybe yeah, I can't remember if that's the... the you right, know what I'm talking right. about. I do know... Yeah, I do. And now, now it's a book and a movie I can't think of, Ed. You're really <laughs> taxing my old brain. Uh, but it's a really cool book because he, he wrote... You know, it's it's self-created, uh, but then he has notes in the book part. I think it was an Instagram comic to start with. And then mm -hmm. when he published the book, he has, like, running commentary, like a director's commentary that I thought was really interesting. Mike Grell gets creative spotlight mm -hmm. at the beginning of the uh, place guide there. Yeah, and I didn't have anything to to pull out of these. I think that you're looking at Miracle Man is what sent me down the rabbit hole of like, 
I ended up looking up like the crow. I think the first crow is like ninety dollars in this issue. Yeah. Does the uh, does Miracle Man uh, does the price increase there? It was no, twelve no change here. Yeah. But it's just funny to me because I think of comics as really struggling at this time, and yet we're still trading. And also, I, I just I wonder how many people ran this price guide as like important. You know, like it's a lot of pages to print in a magazine in full color. Yeah. Every issue, and it's like we're stores using this. We're like. At this point, were fans trying to figure out how to turn their collections into that dollar amount? Yeah, that's 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 more what it was. Like the stores fucking hated this thing, man, because the people who had come in to try to liquidate were going by wizard prices, and they're over street. Yeah, and also it's probably reader quality copies. Oh, totally. The people are bringing in there and not understanding the uh, wizard went away with the. Uh, they used to have their condition guide for uh, <laughs> I grading saw, comics. I saw something in here about uh, calling cards, which. Uh, crack me up as, as being a um a real real snapshot of a time and i remembered like uh whenever i would go on trips with with friends as a kid my parents would give me like their at&t calling card and and right, uh, i remember that yeah. and, and uh because long distance was even like we live in a 412 area code to call the 724 area code was expensive and that's like our adjacent area code so to call anywhere else it, it could be yeah, mu- I, it could be much more i grew up with a 724 okay yeah yeah so um you would have to type in a sequence of maybe 30 numbers it would be you call the 800 number for the card then you have your code and then you have the phone number that you're going to call so my mom would give me that card whenever like in sixth grade i would go like camping with people just in case if there was an emergency and then uh, when I went to art school, I wonder, did, did your parents hook you up with this at, at, at college? Like, mom gave me that same card, and then I would talk to them on Sundays for, like, five minutes or something. Like, like, it's not like we timed it or whatever, but we were conscious that, like, this is, the meter is running. Yeah. And there was a very small amount of time, like, it would be on Sundays, where uh, you, there's the payphone at the Kubert School Mansion, pop in your million numbers and uh chat with them because like i was right on the cusp of like the cheap cell phones like like we couldn't i couldn't afford that um but did the calling card thing and then of course you remember the uh chris rock uh commercials man for 99 cents like that that whole that whole deal yeah i remember it wasn't just him (laughs) that was a gimmick for a lot of them yeah what can can you do with a dollar this guest column so these issues are after i was a reader yes kind of like these guest columns although that said i don't get much out of this one there's there's some let's let's play the speculator game dude because he talks about well he's talking about loyalty right and it's loyalty to publishers so is it like fan loyalty to publishers and you start reading and it's like no it's creator loyalty to publishers right pretty esoteric sure yeah and, and this is the space for that um and also, like, I, I sort of almost, I don't agree with almost anything that uh, that Chadwick is saying here, because to me, it's, unless he has just, like, such a sweet deal, which, which, which I know that the Frank Miller deal is, is the sweetest deal that, that, uh, that Dark Horse has, man, and a lot of things are, are, are based off the Frank Miller deal, so, uh, you know, it's not the Paul Chadwick deal, uh, so, you know, you're not, you're not really a partner, you, you know, you're, you're getting a royalty, so... Uh, unless it's 50 50 that like we're like loyalty I just don't understand that part but the speculation game that we can play uh, is somewhere up here he's talking about another nameless yeah I'll read it okay yeah I recall one early Dark Horse creator who made quite a pile of cash with much assistance writing and drawing by other hands provided by Dark Horse despite his good fortune he read Dave Sims latest publishers or scum track in Sims Cerebus and had come to work loaded for bear, seething over his exploitation. He turned to self-publishing, and his sales and profile sunk into obscurity. So, uh, who, who do you think, man? I have no idea. Do nope, you have, nobody comes to mind? No. I'm just going to say Chris Warner. Black Cross. He just retired from Dark Horse. Like, he was there the whole time. I don't think he went anywhere. He was in an editorial position, like art director or something for a long time. So I'm guessing it was not Chris Chris Warner. Okay. You don't have anybody in mind? I don't. And Ron I just, Randall Trecker? I mean, for all I know, I don't know what his career was, but it says that, that uh, this, this was after nixing an animation deal that Dark Horse had snared. So does that give you a clue? I don't know who had any kind of... I don't know who that would be. I just don't... I didn't have loyalty to Dark Horse to the point that I can tell you anybody outside of those legend dudes that would have been like a regular there. Oh, you know what? I, I Scratch Chris Warner. I, I think I know who it is, man. 
Boris the Bear. Cause, oh, cause, maybe. Because it's Dark Horse, and then it's self-published at Ricochet um, Press or Rico- something like that. Yeah. Uh, and so animation, like, that that seems very right for animation, especially in the post, like, Ninja Turtles Plus, space. that would uh, kind of sync up well with Paul Chadwick, because, like, Boris the Bear, I think, is Dark Horse's first comic, and I think Dark Horse Presents is their second comic. That, that's why and I so said, it'd be like, those, you know, that's whenever it's a small team in the beginning, like, you would know that guy and that, stuff. Yeah, that's why I said Chris Warner, but, uh, yeah, you convinced me there. I think it's Boris the Bear. Is that I, I, yeah, that's my guess, too. Because, I'm with you. Because that did sink into obscurity. Like, there's a lot of issues of Boris the Bear, and they're, they're nowhere. So, sidestep a little bit here. I believe Chris Warner was part of that APA 5 that Frank Miller was part of. I Chadwick think was. Richardson might have been. Like, that's the direction we need to go if we really want to try to get our hands on, like, some of those or get a scan or something. Guys. Yeah, it seems like a lot of the Dark Horse stuff came out of that, that APA. We got, we got Richard's email, man. Richardson's email. Yeah, we should, we should, uh, we should see if, if, if we can find more of that stuff. I, 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 it's shocking to me that that stuff is not more visible my, somewhere. My dream... Because like we're at that level now where we got it all. We, we, we can get access to all of it. The comic, my, my holy grail is to read the complete Frank Miller, um, whatever that noir story is, from, AP, from Apple 5. You know, we only have chapter 9, 10, 10 pages of chapter 9. So that, you know, if we're going by 10 page chapters, chapters there might be a 100 page book out there, 100 page story of Frank Miller's that, that we haven't read, that we don't have access to. And that to me is like, Something to, to shoot for. Yeah. So uh, with this profile, you, I mean, you see what it is. We had Mark Hamill last time, Lou Ferrigno this time. Who gives a motherfuck? Well <laughs> said, Ed. <laughs> you guys, man, it's all your fault. We put one of these out and get 12,000 12, uh, viewers overnight. We got to cover it. But in terms of a snapshot in, in history... Uh, you can sort of do no better than Wizard. It gives you the temperature of the day. And uh, the day was uh, kind of a pile of feces. I wonder if we have a comics journal like the uh, 96 wrap-up of the comics journal, like the year in review. Because I would be very curious, one, to rinse this out of my mouth. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but also to see that other perspective of, you know, what were the good comics of the year. Yeah. Because we're not seeing them covered here. No, we, we really aren't. And uh, there aren't too many more wizards to, to go through because when, when you really start getting, you know, Sarah Michelle Geller's photo on the cover and Hugh Jackman as Wolverine's photo on the cover, like, you are, you are f- completely away from anything that we have interest in. Uh, we will not even get close to those issues. But what we do have, we have amazing heroes, every issue. We have... All the most important issues of Comics Journal, digitally, if not in person, physical copies. Uh, we have every issue of Comics Scene, whether uh, digital or, or physical. So uh, those will be uh, the fun ones to start to dust off. But you cannot discredit the popularity of this. And, and clearly that audience who, who read this stuff, man, they're, they're, they are kayfabe uh, viewers. <laughs> Good to go. Yeah. Kayfabers, like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell so that we can notify you when new videos are available. Jimmy and I are on the road to 100,000 subscribers. So if you have not uh, done so yet and you enjoy our content, please subscribe to the channel. Helps us out a lot. We have a Patreon where the King Kayfabers on the Patreon get access to all the videos uh, before anybody else. Mitigates the Kayfabe effect and uh, is another way to support the channel. Ultimately, however, our books are the way that uh, we're able to keep bringing you these videos on the regular. Jimmy, please let the people know what you have out in the wild, man. Yeah, best thing to do for my latest comics is patreon.com slash jimrug. It's where I've been scanning and posting pages as I as I do my self-published stuff. In comic shops, you can find Street Angel, Princess of Poverty, and Street Angel, Deadliest Girl Alive. These are my two Street Angel collections. All the Street Angel comics are in these two books from Image, so you can get them wherever you get Image comics or books. Um, the stuff I've been self-publishing, I'm selling on jimrug.com. That's the 1986 zine, the BW zine, and True Crime Funnies, uh, some nonfiction, a nonfiction anthology featuring three stories, including uh, two wrestling stories in there. So you can find those on my website or on patreon.com slash jimrug. And the Hulk Grand Design, that nice oversized one, is out of print. However, a new trade paperback is coming out in May from Marvel, and you can pre-order that one now wherever you buy books. And I ask you to please do so because it lets Marvel know to keep these things in print. 
I'm going to have a solo art show here in Pittsburgh at the uh, 707 Gallery, downtown Pittsburgh, beginning April 6th. It's going to be up uh, through August, so if you are swinging through Pittsburgh, uh, check it out. I, I, I don't think that there's any charge to check it out, and it's all of my best hip-hop family tree pieces presented to you uh, as beautifully as we can uh, possibly do it. So this is the daily strip that I've been working on for uh, 2024, presenting it to you on all of, all of our social media platforms. There's a webtoon platform and such. Uh, stay tuned for news on this in the future. And I present uh, material ahead of time on, on my own Patreon. Uh, Hip Hop Family Tree Omnibus. Uh, you might still be able to get it pretty cheap on uh, Amazon. It was like 40% off fairly recently. Best book I made to date. A uh, bunch of extra pages. If you got the original Hip Hop Family Tree, uh, there's almost 200 pages worth of stuff in here that you haven't seen yet. The X-Men Grand Design Trilogy trade paperback is in the wild right now. We recently released Red Room Crypto Killers trade paperback. It contains four self-contained stories uh, in the Red Room universe. There are two other Red Room trade paperbacks. Once again, each of these all contain self-contained stories. So you can start at any place. And if you dig the material, then by all means, check out another uh, Red Room comic. Once again, the, the books are the most important way to support the Cartoonist Kayfabe channel. But there are some direct ways to support uh, this YouTube channel. Jimmy, let the people know. You can subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video. We'll keep you up to date on new releases and upcoming appearances. You can also buy Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts, merchandise, hats, mugs, stickers, and more at our spread shop. That link is also under this video. There you have it. All good ways to support the channel. Give them those marching orders, Jimmy, and we'll be on our way. Read more comics.